Hello, uh, I'm Drew Fistini. Um, sorry about the delay there. Um, seems like there are some issues so I'm having to dial in from my phone. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today about um, a couple of my favorite things, which are Linux and open source hardware um, and how RISC-V plays into that. Um, I've made some changes to the slide, but they're not in this system and, and I can't screen share right now. So if you do go to that URL there, um, you'll see the latest one. Um, including what's coming up at ELC with RISC-V. Um, so you can click on that link there and see it. Um, but real quick, um, tomorrow there's going to be a keynote um, from Chris Vasanovich from Berkeley, um, who's the main person behind RISC-V. Um, Kem Raj will also be talking about the software ecosystem tomorrow. Uh, and then on Thursday, um, Calista Redman, who's the CEO of RISC-V International, will be doing an Ask an Expert session. So. Um, if you click on that link for the PDF there for the slides, you'll see it all there because um, these are a little bit outdated. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I design open source hardware projects for a PCB uh, manufacturing service in the U.S. Um, also part of the BeagleBone Org Foundation, which you may, some of you may be familiar with, the BeagleBone or the Pocket Beagle. Um, also part of the Open Source Hardware Association. And one of the things that might be interesting to people that are um, developing hardware is we have a certification program for open source hardware that you can go through. Um, it's a self-certification program, and then you get a nice little logo with your um, uh, serial number for your project. Um, also recently, after um, Embedded World back in February, um, uh, joined the, the new RISC-V Ambassador Program. Um, so you can visit the RISC-V website to find out more about that. Um, so I am, let me proceed here. I'm actually from uh, Chicago, but I moved to Berlin last year. So I've started uh, a embedded Linux meetup here in Berlin. Um, it's on hiatus right now. Um, but uh, when we're able to, we'll start meeting again. So if there's anyone um, in Germany, um, uh, reach out and I can let you know when we might be doing another one. Or if people are interested, we could do a virtual one. Specific to um, RISC-5, there's a bunch of different meetups all around the world. Um, some of the active ones are Munich doing virtual ones. Bay Area is also doing virtual ones. So if you go to risk5.org um, slash local, you can see all the different meetups happening there. So I mentioned uh, that I wanted to talk about Linux on open source hardware with RISC-V. So real quick, I wanted to define what open source hardware means. Um, so this is hardware whose design is made publicly available so that anyone can study, modify, distribute, make, and sell the design or hardware based on that design. So this is the um, community developed definition of open source hardware that the Open Source Hardware Association or OSHWA um, hosts on our website. Um, and I mostly work with electronics. Um, looks like we have some nasty formatting issues there. Um, I created these slides with OpenOffice, um, but this is the PowerPoint export. So, um, if you go back to the um, PDF link that I had earlier, and it'll come up again, you can hit grab the PDF of the slides. Um, so anyways, for electronics, which is mostly what I work with, for open source hardware, we'd be talking about the schematics, um, the board layout, in the original CAD files, so the editable source files, um, like I use KeyCAD, for example. Um, no, it doesn't have to be a uh, open source uh, tool, so it could be something like Altium, for example. Um, and then also the bill materials. So these are the files that you'd be sharing um, for open source hardware. And the whole point here is to enable collaborative development on the hardware design. Um, I talk more about open source hardware um, and options for running Linux on open source hardware. Um, I had a talk I did back in uh, December at uh, 3063, which is a big hacker conference here in Germany. Again, apologies for the formatting. It doesn't, doesn't look like it works so well. Um, so there's the link to the PDF again, um, if you want to pull up the PDF of the slides. Um, so risk five, um, the, is it the instruction, th instruction set for everything? So when you write a C or C++ program, um, it gets compiled into instructions that the processor executes. But how does the compiler know uh, what instructions the CPU understands? So this is defined by the instruction set architecture, um, or the ISA. So it's a standard a set of rules that define the tasks that the processor can perform. The examples you've probably heard of is x86, um, so Intel AMD, which probably most of our laptops and desktops are running and most servers. 
um, and then ARM, which all of us have an ARM uh, processor in our phones most likely. Um, but both of these are proprietary and they need commercial licensing to use them. So RISC-V is a free and open uh, instruction set that came out of a um, team at uh, UC Berkeley. So about 10 years ago, they, wanted, they were doing um, computer architecture research um, and they wanted an instruction set that they could use for doing that research. Um, and they didn't want to deal with licensing a commercial ISA like Intel or ARM. Um, so they decided to make a new uh, clean room ISA based on all, this, all the things they had learned in the past. Um, a couple of things that I don't have on this set of slides is sometimes I get the question, why is it RISC-V as in RISC-V? So it's the fifth uh, risk instruction set to come out of Berkeley, um, the original one being back in the early 80s. Um, and uh, David Patterson from UC Berkeley is one of the people that was the co-creator of the original risk back in the 80s. And he gives a great talk that goes into the kind of the um, historical context for risk and risk five in this talk called Instruction Sets Want to be Free. Um, uh, and then Chris Sasanovich, uh, who's the professor that kind of jump-started the whole risk five project, um, he gives a State of the Union uh, once or twice a year, so this is the most recent one. But he is also speaking tomorrow morning, giving a keynote, so definitely check that out. So what makes RISC-V special? So one of the key things here is that it's simple, um, in that it's a clean design that was based on all the insight that um, this team at Berkeley had had over decades of designing instruction sets. An idea here is that it's modular. So it's something that can scale from a microcontroller all the way up to a supercomputer. Um, and the, the, one of the ways it does this is by breaking things up into extensions. Um, so let me jump ahead to the next slide. Um, let me jump ahead to one more. Oh, do I not have it in there? Oh, I apologize. The slides that I had are slightly different than this. Um, so. The base ISA is just a 32-bit integer ISA. Um, so that's all the base RISC-V ISA is. Um, and you can compile a program right now um, for that, and it'll run in 20 years on some fancy uh, supercomputer that's RISC-V. Um, so the idea here is we build up um, with extensions to the instruction set. So beyond that, there's like multiply, uh, atomic, floating point. Um, so these are different things that can be added on. Um, for example, in the case of Linux, um, it, it requires some of those extensions for Linux to be able to run on RISC V. And the key thing here is once those extensions are um, frozen in the committee, then they stay that way. So um, while there may be future extensions, the instructions that was designed to allow you to both have extensions through committee in the future and also have the area to have um, uh, extensions that are made by the vendors that are designing the processors. And Probably the most important thing with an instruction set is the software ecosystem. It's probably one of the main reasons why we're still using x86 right now. Um, and the RISC V software ecosystem is uh, pretty solid right now. Um, definitely the software, to some degree, has kind of um, jumped ahead of the hardware um, design right now. Um, so we have support in GCC and Clang, glibc, um, Linux kernel has support, um, Zephyr. Um, so all the sort of things that you would expect to see um, on x86 or ARM are kind of there. Um, and the other interesting thing is there's both uh, open source implementations that you can use, um, and there's also commercial implementations. So Rocket and Boom are some of the original RISC-V designs that came out of Berkeley. Uh, Risky and Arian are designs that came out of the Pulp team at ETH CERC, and both of those are being used to build upon both uh, open source implementations and uh, implementations that vendors are doing. Um, another really notable one is Western Digital um, has the Swerve Core, which uh, is kind of meant for a microcontroller sort of application. Um, and Sci 5 is one of the startups that's um, creating a lot of um, cores that can be licensed for um, SOCs that companies might build. Ooh, that is quite small there. Another, another bit of formatting uh, problem, but. Um, as I was saying, the, the point here is that for, for it to be an extensible instruction set that can go from a microcontroller to a supercomputer. Um, and while it was created at Berkeley, um, the RISC-V Foundation um, now hosts the standard on RISC-V.org. Um, it should actually be RISC-V International now. So um, you'll notice a lot of references to RISC-V Foundation earlier.
a new organization called Risk Five International was started. Um, that Swiss is a Swiss-based organization um, to eliminate any of the political considerations um, because it used to be based in the U.S. Um, there's over 400 members now. It keeps on growing. I'm sure Calista can give the latest numbers on Thursday, but it um, includes companies and universities, and even you as an individual, um, you can join um, the Risk Five International as, a, as an individual member. One of the ways I've stayed up to uh, um, stayed up on what's happening is the YouTube channel for the Risk Five Foundation has tons of talks. They have uh, workshops and summits every year, um, so it's a great um, great uh, source of knowledge if you want to learn more. Um, and then one of the really exciting things is companies like NVIDIA and Western Digital are planning to ship millions of devices with Risk Five. So like with Western Digital, they're replacing the little controller um, in all their different disk drives and, and storage products um, to have Risk Five based microcontrollers. Uh, NVIDIA is also replacing some of the management and controller um, uh, cores in their graphics cards with Risk Five. Um, so one thing that this can do is help avoid the licensing fees for a core, um, but it also above that, so with ARM, only a few companies have microarchitectural licenses like Qualcomm and Apple. So everyone else is just licensing a core from ARM. They don't have the freedom to change the uh, microarchitecture if they want to. Um, so RISC-V uh, allows you to leverage existing open source implementations like Boom and Rocket from Berkeley, or uh, the designs from the Pulp team at ECH Zurich or Swerve from Western Digital. It allows you to change the microarchitecture to what best suits your product. Um, so there's a freedom there when it comes to the implementation of the instruction set as well. Let's see, jump to the next slide here. Um, actually, before I do that, I wanted to make one point here um, that oftentimes people hear risk five and they think it, it means open source. Um, so risk five is just an instruction set um, specification. And uh, that is open source under Creative Commons, so anyone can use it if they want to. Um, but the implementations of risk five um, are both uh, open source ones and there's both proprietary ones. So um, just because it says risk five doesn't mean the, the actual design of the chip is all open source. Um, but in order for us to have open source chips, which is something I'm very excited about. We need to have an open source instruction set because we couldn't take the ARM instruction set or the Intel instruction set and design an open source chip around that because those instruction sets are proprietary. So I mentioned industry. So one of the interesting organizations um, and one of the first to get going with this five was low risk. So <clears throat> this is a not-for-profit organization based in the UK. It was started by some of the people behind Raspberry Pi. Um, one of the board members and one of the, the main software developers, uh, Andrew Bradbury. Um, the idea here is they wanted to create an open source system on chip that you could use for doing you know, something like a smartphone or a single board computer. So I think this is a really exciting goal. They're still working on it, but one of the things you may have heard from them more recently is they're working with Google on this security um, processor project called Open Python that's using a, a RISC-V core from ETH Zurich. Um, I wrote an article about RISC-V um, earlier this year in a magazine called Hackspace Magazine. So especially if you want to kind of uh, introduce RISC-V to someone who's not too familiar with computer architecture, this might be a nice overview. So one of the first companies and one of the first startups that um, came out of this RISC-V um, uh, phenomenon was sci -Fi. So it was founded by some of the people at Berkeley that um, designed the RISC-V architecture. <clears throat> and a few years ago at ELC, um, they were one of the big sponsors, uh, and they had recently come out with this microcontroller called the FE310. So this, actually, that's not it. It's uh, over on the, the smaller chip on the right, lower right-hand side there. Um, so this was a 32-bit microcontroller. It was really exciting at the time. Um, however, my main interest is Linux, so this is not quite good enough to run Linux. So let's talk about chips that can run Linux. Um, risk five chips that can run Linux. Um, and there again is the link on that slide there um, because the formatting of these slides is not ideal and also there's some newer information in them. So if you wanna uh, grab that link there, um, you'll be able to see them. So the first one that was kind of a big excitement for everyone was back in uh, Fosdem 2018, 5.5. Um, they just launched this new 
uh, Pentacore 64-bit RISC-5 um, SOC. Um, and then they made a um, dev board called the High Five Unleashed. Um, so this is really exciting. This is still probably the best board you can get if you want to run Linux on RISC-5. Um, it's got four 64-bit um, uh, cores. It's got a bunch of DDR memory. So um, it's a real nice board. The problem is Sci5 is the IP company, a, a, a hardware design company. They don't actually intend on making chips. So this was just kind of a proof of concept. Uh, so there was only, I think, maybe 100 made, and they were $1,000. So it was both expensive and pretty limited, um, though it is still probably the best option for uh, Linux on this size. Um, and one of the places you'll see it being used is people that are working on distros like Fedora and Debian. And you can even have a full uh, um, desktop um, with RISC-V here. So this is with the High 5 Unleashed board and also some pretty expensive FPGA cards and a PCI Express adapter. Um, you can actually run a full um, uh, GNOME desktop here. Um, this is Fedora. Um, and uh, David, um, who's one of the people from Sci-5 that I've been talking to, uh, he actually has one of these set up um, that he does work for uh, Fedora uh, on. Though so that a really expensive rear board's not super practical. So um, one of the other things that we can do is use QEMU. So um, QEMU has uh, support for uh, RISC-V on it. And um, Western, Alistair from Western Digital has done a really good job getting all that working. So you can actually, uh, without any hardware, go run the Fedora um, uh, RISC-V port on QEMU on your computer or your server. And you can also run Debian. So Debian also has a port as well. So we can use the Hi5 board, which is pretty expensive and hard to get. We can use QMU um, on our Intel, you know, powerful laptop or desktop or server. Um, so that's not super exciting, especially if you like, you know, embedded boards. So one of the things that's quite excited, uh, quite exciting right now is this board. Um, so this is a board with the Kendrite K210 um, uh, system on chip. Um, and this is from a company called Cypede. Uh, and la last year and also this year, um, some people, um, including Damian Lamal, Western Judo, have been hacking away to get this thing to run Linux. Um, the catch here is that it only has eight megabytes of SRAM. So if you look for the Cypede Max bit, um, you can get that board. Um, it's only $13. This is a dual core 64-bit um, RISC-V processor running at 400 megahertz, uh, and it has eight megabytes of SRAM, which is a lot of SRAM for a microcontroller, but not so much for Linux. The other unfortunate thing here is that it does have an MMU, but the MMU is an older spec, so it's not supported by Linux. Um, so basically right now you can get a build root instance or you can get a build root fork from Damien, which will soon go upstream, and uh, you can run BusyBox. Uh, but right now we're kind of stuck. Um, there needs to be more work to make it more useful. Um, but you can test out U-Boot and OpenSDI and a bunch of work in the Linux kernel <clears throat> on this board. So um, for $13, it's definitely worth getting if you have interest in, in playing or off Linux on RISC-V. If you go to the PDF link, I have more updated slides there. Um, as of Linux 5.8, when that comes out, it'll be fully supported. Um, and uh, U-Boot uh, uh, patches were just uh, posted on the mailing list. So soon there should be support for this board and, and the Kendrite processor and U-Boot, um, all, all there now in Linux. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where this goes because the hardware is cheap. A lot of people will get their hands on it. And there's another little uh, graphic of it there, or in photo of it there, uh, running Linux. Um, so you can see I have, this is back in February, uh, I was running Linux 5.6, which is mainline at the time. Uh, and we're using six of the eight megabytes. So uh, not a lot of room to do stuff, but um, still interesting to experiment with. And this is another version of the board that has a wireless uh, Wi-Fi chipset on it as well. So you could potentially, through serial, connect to network services. But again, memory becomes a real issue with trying to do more than just running a busy box. Uh, and Cypede has an image that you can download there if you don't want to run build it yourself. Uh, so things that are coming up in 2020, well, it's already June. Uh, so 
I believe in, uh, later this year, um, maybe September, August, September, um, a microchip is going to be coming out with the Polar Fire SOC. Um, so this is a FPGA um, chip with a hard RISC-V core in it. I believe it has four hard RISC-V cores. Um, so in the slides, I have a little bit more information, the PDF that I've been mentioning. Um, but uh, if you type in microchip Polar Fire SOC, you can find out information about it. It's not out yet, but it's coming soon. And last week, Microchip just announced that they're going to be doing a uh, dev board for it called the Icicle Board. Uh, so that's going to be on Crowd Supply. You can go to Crowd Supply right now and look for the Icicle Board. Um, and you can uh, type in your email address, and they'll let you know when that campaign goes live. Um, it's going to be less expensive than the Sci-Fi Board, but um, you know maybe like half as expensive, uh, which depending on your frame of reference might be very expensive um, because it's not going to be like Google Bone or Raspberry Pi price, but um, at least it's it's something that'll be available. And the Polar Fire SOC is going to be a real chip that's available to distribution. So we'll see other boards probably that use this, and, and those might be more cost optimized. Um, the other thing that's really exciting is back at the risc V Summit in December, um, there was an announcement that the Open Hardware Group, um, which is another industry organization with companies like NXP and Silicon Labs, are working on open source um, open source designs essentially to build an SOC. Um, so the one that they announced here, let me go to the next slide, I think it has an image, uh, is called the Core V Chassis SOC. So this, you can think of it as one of the NXP, formerly Freescale, IMX um, chips, but with the ARM core ripped out and RISC V core dropped in. Um, so with this SOC, now it's just going to tape out in the second half of this year as a test chip, and then there'll probably be a limited run of dev boards. Um, but I think if it works out, we might see someone like NXP roll this out as an actual product. Um, and if we could get to that point, then I think we can definitely start making um, more affordable dev boards, like sub $100 dev boards um, that have a real hard um, risk five SOC. But still kind of waiting on that. So have to be a little patient. But one thing we can do right now, we don't have to wait for the, the silicon chips to, to hit the market, um, is we can use FPGAs. So don't have a lot of time here, but a great talk um, from a conference last year was from Megan Wax from Sci-Fi, where she talks about combining both uh, FPGAs and risk fives. Uh, so I'll just talk a little bit about the basics of FPGAs. Um, so an FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. And you can think of it as a sea or an ocean of, of logic elements inside the chip that we can configure to be any sort of digital logic that we want it to be, including a processor. So we can have what's called a soft processor core loaded into the FPGA. One of the things that's been really exciting in the last few years is there's not open source tool chains. So FPGA uh, vendor tool chains were kind of notoriously bulky and, and not so nice to work with. So there's now a few FPGAs that work with open source tools. It started with the Lattice X40, um, but it's a bit too small for us to fit a RISC-V core in it that can run Linux. Um, but then the other thing that came along called Project Trellis, which supports a more powerful FPGA called the ECP5 from Lattice, and this one is actually big enough for us to be able to um, fit Linux into it, fit, fit a RISC-V processor that's capable of running Linux into it. OK, so it looks like people can actually hear me because uh, I'm seeing some uh, questions. It's not particularly interactive, um, like other conferences I've done so far virtually. Um, ooh, so I see some interesting questions uh, I'll get to at the end of the talk. So. Uh, we have support for Lattice, a um, couple of the Lattice parts, uh, but the majority of the FPGA mar market is uh, Xilinx or Altera Intel. Now, the good news for Xilinx is, is for some of the Xilinx parts, the Series 7, there is soon going to be open source support for that. It's already kind of there if you want to get into the repos and play around with it. But that means in the future, we'll be able to use only free software tools to build a really capable, like, multi-core uh, risk five Linux system on a Xilinx part. Um, wrote another article that's kind of an overview of the FPGAs and the whole phenomenon of the open FPGA tool chain. Um, so one of the projects I want to talk about kind of specifically here at the end is 
a little uh, experiment that me and some other people did to uh, get Linux running on a conference badge with Risk Five. So there's this really fun hardware hacking conference every year called the Hackaday Supercon. It happens in November in Los Angeles. Um, and this year, um, like, is the trend now is if you go to one of these hardware conferences, you get a electronic kind of name badge to hack on. The one they had this year was in this Game Boy form factor, and it had the ECP5 FPGA, which is the one that's supported by open source tools and is big enough for us to fit a, a proper RISC-V core that can run Linux. So this is us hacking on it in the um, alley here at the conference. Um, some of the people are actually here at ELC. Uh, actually, I think Michael Welling is actually giving a talk right now about SPI. Um, so Michael and Tim Ansel and Sean Cross and Jacob Creed and we all kind of uh, hung together over the weekend and, and tried to get Linux running on this. So the first approach was that it had 16 megabytes of SRAM built into it. However, we weren't able to get that to work. However, because it was a hardware hacking conference, Jacob had uh, ahead of time seen the design of the batch and designed this expansion board which gave us 32 megabytes of SD RAM. So this proved to be enough memory, um, and also it was DRAM, which makes it a little bit easier for Linux, uh, that we were able to um, get its run. So real quick here, the design of it, if you can conceptualize. So remember the front there kind of looked like that Game Boy. Um, and then on the back, there's actually an expansion slots for um, hardware cartridges, so to speak. So this is the DRAM cartridge that slides into the back there. And we were able to then get Linux running. But how did we do that? So real quick, I was talking about soft cores, and it's kind of hard to conceptualize maybe. So you can think of this as a bird's eye macro view of all those little gates in the FPGA zoomed out. Like the one that we were using, I think, had 45,000 logic elements that we can program. So this is what it looks like when we've configured it to be a Linux-capable RISC-V core. Um, and there's still space left. So that's the, the good news is we could still add new functionality, new peripherals if we wanted to. So I don't come from a chip design background. I come from a, a software background and, and I do some more board level hardware design. Um, so not too, uh, not too familiar with all the different things, the languages that are used for uh, processor design. So we actually used Python in this project and that was really great. Um, so if you're interested in how one might use Python to design um, hardware, um, you can check out this talk here from Tim where he talks about a really interesting project where they built this open source hardware to be able to record um, uh, open source conferences. Uh, maybe this one someday. And one of the reasons for that is that um, Tim thinks that Python is a really powerful language. And using this framework called MeGen, we can actually generate what is normally used for chip design, which is Verilog, very easily. Here's just a little um, snippet of what it looks like. Um, uh, which if you've done any Verilog or VHDL, you might see how that kind of translates there to the Python syntax. Um, not sure how if you'll be able to see this, but if you, you can go to the URL there if it's too small. Uh, but this is a side-by-side -side comparison um, of what MeGen looks like. So MeGen is a uh, essentially a, a hardware description language that's written in Python. Um, so instead of using Verilog or VHDL, which are the traditional hardware description language that people in industry will use to design processors, we can do it in Python. Um, and you can see here the comparison of, I think it's a D flip-flop, which is a very, very basic digital circuit, both done in Python with that MeGen framework and then done in the traditional uh, Verilog. So on Python MeGen, we add in LIDEX. So LIDEX is a framework that gives us a bunch of different uh, IP cores, which you can think of as peripherals that we need for building our system on chip in the FPGA. So you can check it out on GitHub there. Um, Enjoy Digital is, uh, his name's uh, Florent, and he's one of the main people behind this project. Um, so just to go over it again, we have this MeGen, um, framework that allows us to do what we would normally do with Verilog or HDL in Python instead. And then on top of that, we have LightX, which is this framework that allows us to um, build these different IP modules in MeGen and then glue them all together into an SOC, which is a system on chip, which 
you know, is normally what you're used to in, in one of these single board computers or a phone. Don't know if you can see that there, but it's a little bit of a ASCII diagram there of how this comes together. So we have our open source FPGA tool chain. We have that MeGen framework for Python, which lets us do hardware um, description language in Python. Uh, and then LIDEX gives us different functionality like Ethernet um, controller, SATA controller, DRAM controller, USB, a bunch of different peripherals. In this project, we just use the DRAM controller and the serial controller. Now, beyond that, okay, so we have these different hardware IP that we can string together, but how do we actually get Linux on it? We need a processor. So we use the VEX RISC V, which is a nice open source 32 bit uh, RISC V implementation. And this processor is actually capable of running Linux. Um, so there's a, there's a project actually called Linux on LIDEX VEX RISC that glues this all together for us. Um, so if you have one of these boards, um, if you go to the URL there, it'll list a bunch of different FPGA development boards. If you have one of those boards, you can just clone this repo, run through the build, and you'll have Linux booting on your FPGA board on this RISC-V core. Um, so that is quite neat if you have one of those FPGA boards. And I'll go over a few options um, in, in a moment. Uh, here's what it looks like with Linux booting on the soft RISC-V core that's inside the FPGA. ECP5 FPGA uh, connected through a serial port to my computer because we didn't have the display there working at the time. Uh, so we have a little serial port and we can interact with the BusyBox instance that's running on that soft core inside of Linux. And this is all done with free software, no proprietary tool chains involved. So when we got back from the conference, thought it would be good to um, add back the support that we hacked together um, to the Linux on Linux project. Um, this probably is not particularly useful to people that were not at the conference, but if you want to look at what does it look like to add a new board to Linux on LIDEX, um, this is maybe a good uh, reference point. Um, and if, I don't know if you'll be able to see that there, but this is just to give you an idea of what the syntax looks like. So this is a file where we're describing the, the pins that we have on our FPGA and how they connect to the different um, ports on, our, on the badge. Um, and this is normally something that's done in Verilog. In this case, it's done in Python, thanks to MeGen. And one of the things that I thought was particularly useful, since I'm not super proficient with Verilog, was I'm able to look at this and get a much better feel for what's happening. And I think part of that is we leverage the object oriented nature of Python um, to be able to just import these modules and just extend and add what we need for our specific um, board. Um, for example, this is how it um, uh, loads the bit stream, which is essentially the, the binary you could think of that you would have from a, from a tool, a programming tool chain. We load it onto the FPGA. Um, so we were just able to like copy a similar board and then just tweak it for the specifics for our board. So another good example of that um, nice extensibility that Python gives us is we had this SDRAM chip and it, no one had used it before. So all we had to do is take light DRAM, which is the um, LightX DRAM controller, and just extend it uh, with the specifics for our uh, DRAM chip, which we got from the data sheet. So we didn't have to go write our own DRAM controller in Verilog or deal with a bunch of Verilog, which would have been hard for me to understand. We just um, can do it all in the nice object oriented nature of Python. And one of the points Tim will make is, you know, um, there's a lot more software engineers than hardware engineers. And one way to get more people into chip design, especially with the great open source tools that are, are coming out now, um, is by making it uh, more easier for uh, software engineers to, to get into the ways that hardware is developed. So Python is, is a nice way of doing that. So you don't have to learn a new language like Verilog or VHDL. Oh, and then the other nice thing, which I encourage you, if you're interested in FPGAs and Linux, um, check out Linux on LightX because Enjoy Digital, who is Florent, is super responsive. So while we had Linux booting, it was taking 300 seconds, which is not very fun. Um, and I posted a uh, um, issue, and within a few hours, he was like, oh, here's a, here's a fix. And it now booted in 30 seconds. Um, this is by loading it over serial. It, it boots faster now because we can use it from the flash. But anyways, opened up an issue within a few hours, got a 10x in per, uh, performance improvement. So I thought that was pretty awesome. 
And another, just a, another example, just to underscore why I think um, MeGen and Lidex um, using Python are really nice. So this is a part of the um, change that um, uh, Florent made to make it go faster. Uh, I'm not super familiar with this design, but I can kind of see here from the diff that he made the LQ cache wider. Uh, and for me, understanding Python, it was much easier than having to work through some dialog. So. Just kind of my opinion, I always think Python's quite interesting for doing hardware design. And we finally did get the uh, LCD working in the end. Uh, Greg Davil, who's an awesome hardware hacker in Australia, has it running here in this tweet. Um, so you don't have this badge if you weren't at the conference, but let's say you want to play around with this stuff. What boards can you get? Um, so these would be boards with that ECD5 FPGA from Lattice, which is supported by the open source tool chain and it's big enough to have a Linux-capable core. So one board is the Radiona ULX3S, and that is from uh, a hackerspace in Croatia called Radiona, and they did a crowdfunding campaign on CrowdSupply a few months ago. So you can check that out if you're interested in that board. And then another board that I quite like a lot is the Orange Crab from Cray. So this has 128 megabytes of DDR RAM. So that's, that's quite enough for us to do some interesting things with Linux. It also has an SD card, um, and support is just landed recently for us to be able to boot Linux from the SD card. So we can actually have a proper like um, root FS, and we have plenty of RAM to run Linux. So um, I think it'll be quite interesting. Uh, it's already running on Linux, so you can check it out. Um, and he also did a campaign on GrooveCats, which is a different uh, website. Uh, not just finished. I think he'll be giving more information soon on, on how to purchase it now if that's ended. But um, if you go to the link in the slide there, it takes you to the GitHub. Um, that's a good place to follow for more information. And uh, if you're just getting to FPGAs, uh, one that's big enough to run, a Linux-capable core might not be the best route. So um, this little board here is called the FOMU, and it's great way to get started with FPGAs. There's a nice self-paced tutorial that takes you through um, different ways of programming FPGA, um, including LIDEX. Um, so it's a good way to get some experience before you jump into something like Linux on LIDEX with a bigger FPGA. It also fits inside your USB port, which is kind of fun. So you can do it wherever you go. Uh, and if you don't have any hardware, one of the really nice pieces of software um, is called Renode um, from Ant Micro. And it's an open source project that's essentially a, uh, uh, a batteries included emulator for embedded boards. So you can go to renode.io and you'll see on there a bunch of different dev boards. There's more than this. Um, but for example, that Sci5 Unleashed board, a really expensive board that's pretty rare, it's in there. Um, several FPGA boards are in there as well. So what this does is it allows us to use you know, our fast laptop or desktop um, or even server, that, and we can run this emulator. Um, it's a fork of QMU, but it has had a lot of stuff added to it. So here is a little photo of me on my laptop running Renode, um, and it's emulating that Sci-Fi Unleashed board. So that really expensive, hard to get board. I have the same environment on my laptop here. Uh, and because it's running like on a modern Core i7, it's actually pretty responsive. So. It's a really nice way of getting involved um, with RISC V if you don't have any hardware at all. You can also use QMU, uh, but if you want to kind of emulate specific boards, Renode is a really nice way to do that. Um, it looks like I have come to the end. Uh, please do hit that URL because the slides that are on GitHub are formatted properly and also have a lot more information. One of the things that is not in here is last week at the RISC V Munich meetup, um, Bjorn Topol uh, gave a really interesting talk about how to get involved in the RISC-V Linux kernel development. And he talks about uh, some of the to-dos that are still needed. Um, it makes the point that RISC-V is pretty new, and it's relatively simple compared to the other architectures that are supported in Linux. So if you want to dig in and start working, you know, get some experience with kernel development, RISC-V is a good place to look. Um, it's simple enough that you can maybe fit it all into your head, unlike, you know, ARM or, or Intel. All right, I think we do have some questions here. Oh, real quick. They are in the slides, but not these PowerPoint slides, but the PDF. Um, 
really great book. It's called The Risk Five Reader. Um, if you want to kind of have a short 100 page book that gives you up to speed with what Risk Five is and the different extensions, that's a great, um, great resource. Uh, the, Risk, the Risk Five Reader, you'll find it on Amazon or wherever. Okay, we have some questions here. All right, so I saw Robert Day say zinc. Maybe I had a typo. Um, so yeah, so going back to the microchip polar fire SOC, which is that FPGA with the hard risk five cores, um, it's similar to the xylem zinc. Um, you can think of it that way. And that should uh, definitely get in touch with microchip if you're interested, but I believe that should be coming Q3 this year, um, both as the chip and then also the Isocle dev boards that you can you can buy to get started. All right, uh, Ken, hello, Ken. And, and don't forget, uh, Ken has a, uh, Ken Raj has a talk tomorrow about the software ecosystem for this size. Um, so he's asking, when can we expect uh, BeagleBone RPI range, uh, um, this five single board computer? Um, Actually, maybe I should be doing something with these questions. Should I be answering them? Um, so the, 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 the impediment there to having a sub-100 dollar board is a SOC um, that's affordable. Um, thus far, a lot of the companies are um, IP-only companies like Sci-Fi, so they just basically make test chips. Um, other companies like Western Digital are just doing them for internal use. Um, so the open hardware group, if that turns into an NXP product, I think that could definitely be something that opens the chassis. That could be something that we could do. Um, the Polar Fire SOC, I think, still might be too expensive because it has that FPGA on it as well. Um, so I'm actually pretty excited to see what Kendrite does. Um, so if Kendrite was to come out with one that had an external uh, memory bus, then we could have a proper system. So right now, basically, we're waiting on SEC. Uh, that's uh, basically sold as a real product that we can buy and build boards around. I do think we'll we'll see that in 2021 that we'll see hundred dollar or less boards that can run uh, Risk Five on a on a hard uh, SOC. Uh, let me see here. I'm not quite sure if that's supposed to be typing in text answers, but I'll just answer these with audio, assuming that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So someone asked, what is your, uh, hold on a second. I guess I'm supposed to be typing. Okay, the engineer says I can just talk um, virtually, so before time runs out, I will uh, do that. By the way, in the Slack, we now have one for Risk Five. Um, it was created yesterday, so if you look in the Slack, it's like number two uh, dash Risk Five. So we'll we can do more questions and answers in there as well. And don't forget, there's keynote tomorrow, and then Ken talk. Um, what is your estimate of the effort required to develop a low power Risk Five core? Um, so check out ETH Zurich. They have the PULP team there, the PULP, uh, which is parallel ultra low power. So they've been doing a lot of work on energy efficient uh, RISC-V cores and all the work that they do is open source. Um, so that's an interesting thing to check out. Um, in terms of companies, I think there's a company called Greenways that's doing like low power sensor microcontrollers with RISC-V. But definitely check out ETH Zurich uh, PULP. Any idea if RISC five can be done in the Pink Z1 board? Um, so I believe that's the Xilinx part. Um, definitely, um, if you check the Linux on Lidex uh, uh, repo, which I showed earlier, um, there's a bunch of boards in there. So of them are Xilinx. Um, so if it's not listed there, it's probably just a matter of, of getting all the specifics of the boards in there. But um, the, the Xilinx part should be supported. They're supported with the Xilinx toolchain. Um, which is a giant thing. It's like 40 gigabytes. Um, but the SimpleFlow project is very close to having some of those working with the open source tool chain. So um, you don't necessarily have to use the Zilink uh, um, proprietary tool chain if you wait a little bit. Um, 
But with the, by the way, with the pink Z1 board that you mentioned there, I would say go ahead and open up an issue on the Linux on Linux X Risk repo. And I'm sure uh, Enjoy Digital, which is uh, Florent, will probably respond. Um, maybe that is all the questions. All the rest of them are wondering where I was because I was having issues with uh, doing it over web audio and I had to dial in. So hopefully that wasn't too painful. Um, and please do check the slides. Um, oh, are there more questions? There's a second page. Oh, no, it's just about me not being able to get it working. Um, yeah, so if there's any more questions, happy to take them here. Um, I think I'm over the time anyways. So um, thank you for attending. Uh, hopefully I'll see you in the Slack. Um, this is not very interactive, unfortunately, because we're virtual, but um, yeah, I definitely would love to have more interactive Q&A over in the Slack. I, um, hmm. I guess this is done. Um, can the engineer hear me?